Oh, mm. Robert, such a pleasure to see you here. A wonderful introduction. I and you, it must be the apotheosis of your career. They've got Bill, uh, Melinda Gates, <laughs> Bill Clinton, <laughs> Judge Rinder. I mean, it sits, of course. It sort of rolls off the tongue, really, doesn't Look, it? Ladies you know. and gentlemen, you'd agree that you'd actually put Judge Rinder first, wouldn't you? Well, thank yes, you very much. absolutely, yes. absolutely. <laughs> You could investigate what happened with Bill Clinton. Mm. <laughs> Rob, wonderful introduction. Mm. But I just want to add that he's also a columnist for The Sun, the London Evening Standard. And of course, in 2019, he brought his no-nonsense approach and some celebrity guests as well to some of the most pressing social and political issues as host of the Channel 4 show, The Rob Rinder Verdict. Mm. And Rob, you very kindly have agreed to be cross-examined by myself Self mm. and the audience tonight. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare your questions because for the last 15 minutes, I'm going to open up the floor to you. And Rob said you can ask him anything, anything. anything. <laughs> yeah. Rob, I'd like to start, of course, with your incredibly successful show, mm. Judge Rinder. I believe it's been going now for six years. What do you think? I know it's incredible, mm. isn't it? What do you think the secret is? to the success of it, besides you? Uh, well, I, I, I'm incidental, uh, genuinely, I think I'm incidental to it, but more about that, I think, in due course. You've made television, so you know you get um, disproportionate praise for doing very little. You know, um, in, as you say, my over-generous introduction, people refer to the Who Do You Think You Are, and I'll come back to Judge Rinder in a minute, but the number of people that come up to you and say, gosh, um, I loved your programme, and you think to yourself, well, you know, that's very sweet of you, but frankly, other than speaking the odd word of Russian, I did bugger all. <laughs> you know, um, the extraordinary um, range, the tapestry of talent that goes to create that programme, yes. and the investment of all the producers. And to use a football analogy, um, I get that out of the way first, because I don't, just, no questions about football, I know nothing. <laughs> um, Tottenham Hotspur, there you are. Um, <laughs> Yay! And, um, <laughs> but you stand at the goal line. Yes. And... Um, Everybody else does the work as you're standing there, giving everybody else your undivided indifference and push the ball over. Yes. And then that was a case in Who Do You Think You Are? And there's a similar, well, there's a connective tissue to that and Judge Rinder. Yeah. Um, I, to some extent, I, I'm probably not the um, best person to, to ask why it's a, it's a success. My instinct, my intuition is perhaps threefold. Firstly, that it's despite what you may think, and I always say this when people come and watch the show and sit in the audience, it's completely real. And yes. so, of course, it's entertaining. I mean, a few weeks ago, a woman brought um, her dentist to court, and I wanted to know where in the country this had taken place. I said, Madam, where did you get your teeth done? Answer, in my mouth. <laughs> or, you know, um, four or five years ago, I was making <laughs> applications in The Hague for yes. an arrest warrant on an international case, oh, and I found myself, I think probably about six months ago, uh, dealing with a case where of a city farm and the woman who had taken uh, various animals from the city mm -hmm. farm to a school for, um, well, it was a, a part of London which serves um, underprivileged communities. Anyway, this a goat had eaten the entire contents of this woman's handbag. <laughs> so she, sewed, she sued the owner of the city farm. Yeah. And there was a moment in my ear where my producer yes. said, um, the goat's coming in, <laughs> which is from Birmingham. <laughs> And so there's an almost quasi-Talmudic moment <laughs> when, um, in your judgment, you start oh. saying, um, Mary had a goat. <laughs> um, but the answer to your question, the first part, is authenticity. Yes. So um, even though we might have um, two cases which have that more than thin veneer of pantomime, at its core, I'm genuinely dealing with law, and every case gets a real legal not a, just a verdict, a full judgment. Yes. Very often um, that can put the um, people who make the programme into a coma. Um, but th and they don't bro broadcast the whole thing. You'll see perhaps 30 minutes. Yes. Very often less of perhaps a two hour long arbitration. <laughs> Secondly, the quality and the commitment of the people that make the programme. Yeah. Um, and that's about the production, and, and you know that too. Yes. When you're in front of the camera, perhaps you, you do less I in terms, well, you, you do a lot more because <laughs> um, you produce your own things as well. Mm. Um, for me, I arrive in the morning and the cases are already curated. Yes. And it can take 90 hours to have perhaps a 20-minute case. There's so much that is invested into that. Mm -hmm. Amazing young people, very often young people. And they have to be emotionally literate enough to speak to an incredible broad range of people, from the regulator to perhaps um, people who really are suffering and haven't had um, ongoing life access to education. 
Um, they have to be able, with no legal training, to triage information. Sometimes there'll be a situation where people arrive with two suitcases full of material. Yes. We take it deadly seriously. So without legal training, that young producer will have to ensure that the person isn't just heard, but the material that they provide the court yes. is curated properly. Mm -hmm. And um, lastly, they have to write it in a case for me. Yeah. Um, so I read my cases perhaps, t perhaps an hour before they start. So the quality of the producing matters. And um, I don't know, lastly, there's, there's another quality, which is um, there's a delight in it. I think, you know, I, I, I shame to say my mother's in the front row, I blame her entirely. I have no <laughs> transferable skills at all. Um, some of you will see me on Bake Off later in the year. Oh, yeah, we can't wait um, for that. And, yes. you know, the reason I, 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 I say that, I mean, I, there was a wonderful Woody Allen line, which is, you know, because I have no transferable skills, I can't bash a nail into the wall. I've got nothing. In the event of war, I'd have to be a hostage, which is... Um, <laughs> um, but a what very I eloquent one. Right. <laughs> but, but what I do have, and I, perhaps this is mm. the, the third point, um, is there's a delight in it. And why I refer to food, it's the same reason that, um, you know, my mum's chicken soup is better than any of yours, mm. um, uh, is, is that I think when you delight in what you're doing, yes. it permeates into the work. It really does. And there's never a moment when I shut the door behind me and think, um, what would be funny? Would this be funny or amusing yeah. for television? It's almost incidental that television is being made a lot of the time. Naturally, there's the odd, you know, funny line, but most of the best lines write themselves. It's not me. Uh, I'm just holding a mirror up mm. to sometimes the stupidity of the litigants in a case. Not always. Um, but you see, that's the thing. Yes. I love it. I mean, it's, it's a complete passion gift. for it, yes. Real passion for yes. it. Yes. And um, it's interesting because I'm sure we'll come on to this, but that really, um, it, despite how seemingly light it is, and very often, especially, um, you know, uh, fellow members of, 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 of my Jewish community who come up and whisper to me quietly, usually women, you're my guilty pleasure. <laughs> and I think to myself, you know, um, madam, you really need more imagination than that. Um, although, just very quickly, I, I must say, because it's a, it's a privilege to be here uh, at JW3, and it's a, such a wonderful building, building, such a beacon for the Jewish community. Yes, it is. It's something, yes, it's a, it a space is. that I'm so enormously proud of. It's a place I've brought yes. um, a number of friends, both Jewish and non-Jewish. But there is a thing, I, I was I meant to talk to you uh, about this bit earlier, which is about this Jewish algebra. Anybody that's come to hear me speak knows this, which is that one of the gifts that you get when you have any sort of sort of celebrity and you're gifted a public platform is of course you have the power to bring attention especially yes. to, to charities and issues mm. um, but when you do it in the Jewish community that algebra is for every um, one mitzvah you do you create two broigases <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Uh, I just very very quick story. Um, yes. My court I'm deadly serious, and I always speak to the audience uh, beforehand yeah. uh, for a variety of reasons. But mainly, um, it's important to me that they understand the golden rule to treat all of the litigants, especially how hard it is they're there without lawyers, with the dignity that they would want for them or a member of their family. And it's deadly serious, but they laugh. And I had a woman in the back row uh, fairly recently. I tell the story and she knows me and, and she, uh, having spoken to her, I know she doesn't mind. And there's a lovely Yiddish word. I'm obsessed with Yiddish. She, yes. she was forbidden. That's the best <laughs> word. And in fact, um, it means sour in Yiddish. And uh, it, in fact, if there was a, a calendar of forbidden monthly, she'd be, you know, <laughs> she'd be the Hanukkah month, you know. <laughs> um, and it's two years. I mean, it can take two years because yes. there's, we're really small. It's very oversubscribed. She sat in the back row, didn't move her face at all. Oh, no. And I don't mean Jewish oh. North London not moving yeah. her face. It was it was deliberate, <laughs> and um, <laughs> you know, and she could not move the right. face. She did, yes. And of course, <laughs> so she was sitting in the back row, and um, I could see this. You know, I, I uh, you know, I do react to what the audience think, and very often because I'll research the law, but. Uh, their reaction can inform what I'm assessing, which is trying to determine the objective test, who's been more reasonable. So how they respond really does matter and can inform the outcome sometimes of the arbitration. Didn't move her face. The end of the sitting, I always go over to uh, the audience, say, say thank you very much for your attention, etc. Anyway, she's sitting there. She does this to me. It's my court. You know. I know she's Jewish. She looks like my bubba. She says it. <laughs> <laughs> so I 
Of course, because it triggers a part in you, that, yes. that sort of Derek Eretz thing. Yeah. You know, she will it. know my grandma somehow. <laughs> I don't, so, so I immediately go over. Uh, yes, madam, how can I help you? Well, you can do you, Jaya, but you can't do wheat so. <laughs> I mean, that's... Um, <laughs> So, um, and people always ask me, of course I did, wheat, Leeds, wheat, so I, I was this off. <laughs> anyway, I'm coming this year, please stop hucking me in Chanak, I'm coming, I'm coming. He's coming, yeah. he's committed, right, he's are. committed. Yeah. Rob, who do you think your audience is hmm. for the shows? And, and I mean, obviously here we have tonight, but and what kind of impact do you think that the show has hmm. in the approachability and relatability to law for hmm. the general public? I, I really mean this. I don't mean there's a lovely Yiddish expression, I, but to blow smoke up your tuchus. But I have to tell you that um, <laughs> that is an enormously thoughtful question, and genuinely one I haven't been asked. Who do I think oh. the audience is? Mm. Um, I'm often alarmed. I'm not sure if you've had this experience about going into um, television meetings. I've never spoken about it or genuinely been asked that question. And there's a sort of inverse intellectual snobbery as people talk about their audience. ITV, we have an audience. Channel 4 has an audience. BBC, yes. that's not the BBC audience. The answer is, um, everybody should be your audience. You should be, whenever you're making any art or writing, you should be um, imagining that what you do is accessible for yes. everybody. Yes. Yes. But undoubtedly in television, it's not seen in that way. It's curated, understandably, perhaps it's, um, it's a commercial business. It's very targeted at specific audiences. In my case, daytime is an unusual creature. First of all, because it sits in the daily ritual. So um, once you're embedded, which is very difficult to do, and in my case, it was all muzzle, all luck, that I ended up in this situation. But um, because television is so fragmented and has changed, in other words, it's not generally watched in the way it used to be. The only way, well, because of Netflix and all of the other ways people watch television and consume it, Actually, the only sort of, the, 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 the thing that survived in terrestrial television is daytime, because yes. it's part of the ritual experience of people's daily lives. Mm -hmm. So um, I have the gift of an older audience, and we know this from research and, and, and demographics, um, demographic research, mm -hmm. um, students, yes. um, and you know, a variety of people. Also, we have, um, according to the research, the, um, if any men watch it, we have apparently the highest educated male audience. I don't know how they yes. assess that. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> it's a lovely issue. It sounds like Bubba Masters to me, but there you are. Um, and that's enormously important. The other part of it is that, um, uh, as I said, it's sort of piggybacking off what I was talking about earlier. I really care about the cases. And in terms of what people have taken from it, because the law is real and I give full judgment, so we know, again, so from research that... For example, one of the big problems that we encounter in family disputes, often because somebody's lent another family member money, often where the family have consequently entirely broken down, a totally toxic situation has arisen over an amount of money which, until I did this, these cases, I had no ear for whatsoever. And that's taught me so much. Yeah. And... In the context of that situation, you know, despite the intuitive sense of justice being on the part of the family member having lent the money, often having got themselves into real debt in doing so, um, there's no intention to create legal relations. The lawyers out there will know. If you're not lawyers, you're almost certainly related to one. Um, <laughs> but the reality is that there you have somebody who's found themselves in profound financial crisis. They've done the right thing. They've tried and endeavoured to help their family member get out of debt. Mm. And there they are standing in front of you. And because they don't have anything in writing, there's nothing the court can do about it. And because I go on so often about getting things in writing, we know it's had a tangible effect, um, a real meaningful effect on how family members engage with each other. And apparently, again, I'm always nervous about research and statistics, mm. how they actually assess it. But apparently, um, there's been... Uh, uh, first of all, an, an upsurge in people taking these cases to court, but also people getting things in writing or not lending money to family and friends as a result. Um, that must be satisfying for sure, you. Sure, because know. the yes. law um, should be readily understandable by all of us. Mm. It's our law. Mm. 
You know, um, uh, of course the law is complex, you know, especially if you find yourselves in challenging arenas. Uh, issues involving trusts, for example, yeah. they are eye-wateringly complex. But by and large, you know, I'm sure we'll come on to it, but my, my grandfather, um, who was a Holocaust survivor, and, you know, has really informed, I know I've retrospectively thought about it, but so much of my thinking, he loved this country because it was democracy under the rule of law. And what does that mean? And what that means is that it should be accessible for all of us. Mm -hmm. It should be readily understood. Yeah. Um, and that's what we try to achieve, and I think um, we, I don't always get it right, um, but a lot of the time, um, I think that that's at least started, so, well, not a lot of the time, that's overstating my case, or perhaps being over generous. You know, often when you're a celebrity, you cast yourself as the hero of the narrative. I find myself doing that all the time. <laughs> but what has happened is we've dealt with a whole range of cases a buffet of interesting legal issues that because legal aid has disappeared especially, again a conversation perhaps for another time, that there are no other tribunals that deal with them. Gosh. So one last example perhaps is um, what's become increasingly prevalent is you have a small business mm -hmm. and now you're a restaurant perhaps or you run a kennel, whatever it is, you've got all of the relevant licenses etc. Somebody comes and visits you and they're a disgruntled customer. They may even have animus against you, who knows? And they decide to post an unfavorable review about you online, mm -hmm. and it destroys you. Mm -hmm. In the case that I dealt with not long ago, a um, kennel owner, the disgruntled pet owner decided that because the pet that they owned had come back desperately thin, that the owners of the kennel had tried to kill their animal. And so they decided to post that online. And it doesn't take much for that to get the type of traction which ultimately resulted, and did result in this case, in death threats to the owner of that kennel. Now, what's the remedy for the owner of that small business? And the answer is there's almost nothing. And the reason there's almost nothing is because what's his legal case? Mm. Defamation is impossible. You have to be very rich to have a reputation worth saving. It's £50,000 minimum. You have to serve it in the High Court. Forget about it. Malicious falsehood? Well... When the person posted that review, they reasonably believed, I say reasonably, it was their reasonably held belief that, they, that their dog had been abused in the care of this particular owner. And so the person bringing that case had to prove that the other side were malicious. But again, that, if you like, draws attention yes. to a problem in the law. And mm. during the course of those cases, at least, I hope, I hope, I can't do more than that, mm. makes perhaps people think a little bit before they might act in a malicious fashion. And sometimes, especially in cases, for example, where it's usually a mother, it's not always, who is retrospectively suing for back payment of child support. Again, there's very often little I can do, but what it does is do two things. First of all, it, inform, it informs the public in a very helpful way how useful mediation is, how important it is to remember that your kids ultimately find out who you are. There's no such thing as divorce if you've got children. It's as simple as that. Um, you need to find a way of, and again, I've been gifted this from an incredibly emotionally intelligent mum. It's very useful. But um, that, that ultimately it doesn't matter. You need to do your best to try and hold whatever toxicity you have. Yes, which is The other hard. thing is, and it's also exposed the absence of legal aid, especially for mothers to do anything to try and um, pursue errant, usually partners, usually fathers in court. We have hundreds, thousands of applications for cases of that kind that we just can't deal with. How do you choose them though, Rob? Because as you say, I mean, you're bringing attention to cases that might not normally be heard mm. and you're helping them. But how does the team choose who you're going to do? It's a difficult that one. It must be tough. Well, I mean, not really. I mean, the reality is I mean, it's quite hard to get a case on telly mm. for a variety of reasons. I mean, the first issue, of course, is that most people want to bring an institutional defendant on. And I'd love to have T-Mobile on. It'd be marvellous. <laughs> or one of the utility companies. Yes. Or especially one of the councils, mm -hmm. you know, who are, I mean, you know, uh, or actually uh, any number of the benefit agencies. You know, I took the trouble the other week to try and fill out a universal credit form. And I'm no slouch, don't get yeah. me wrong. I'm not, um, I'm no Isaiah Berlin. I'm not an intellectual <laughs> giant, but I'm not bad, right? You know, I did fairly well. I couldn't do it. Really? And you just think yes. that the people who are most inclined 
most inclined, it's most likely to be met with the challenge of trying to fill that for me and Thank how you. difficult that is. Yes. So um, we can't have those cases on, sadly. So the answer is whoever wants to bring a case. Um, and most of the time, it's because, because it's an arbitration, both parties have to consent. Yeah, sort of similar setup to the, to the Beth Din, really. And it has a sort of <laughs> similar status. Um, yeah. Um, in fact, I thought, you know, we could do the, the, the Jewish edition for Hanukkah. I could do a special one where people come and get gets. That would be a... Um, <laughs> I never thought of that, really. <laughs> what do you think has surprised mm. you most in your journey so far? Oh, I don't know. Surprised me most. Um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, the, just the obscene amount of privilege. Mm. I think that's fair to say. And also, um, you know, uh, uh, where do we be? It hasn't surprised me, I suppose. Mm. I mean, I arrived in telly by pure accident. Yeah, tell us how that happened, because you're obviously a professional criminal barrister. Right. Um, was it your ambition to do this? What happened? I mean, good question. You sound like my grandmother. You know, what happened? <laughs> they were, uh, <laughs> I might look like your grandmother. No, <laughs> no, no. no. Um, <laughs> well, it's been a tiring um, day. <laughs> I mean, the, the, you know, there's a sort of long or short story of it, but the, the kind of uh, middling version is that I'd had a lot of luck in my career, you know. Um, Solicitor saw me young. Uh, I'm sure there's some solicitors and barristers out there. And I'd been given some you know, high profile cases fairly early yes. on. Yes. So I built a, a fairly decent career. And then as legal aid began to constrict, I am and was at a chambers that navigated that commercial turbulence and decided that I would move into money laundering. Mm. Not doing oh. it myself, I hasten to add. No. Oh. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Uh, I wrote a, a little pamphlet on it, a, a small book at the time. I remember the publishers asking um, whether or not I'd like to dedicate it to anyone. I just said, tell readers not to operate heavy machinery. It was the, uh, <laughs> um, and I ended up um, doing sort of international law, mm -hmm. which sounds terribly mm -hmm. grand, um, but it's just law in different countries. Um, but of course, you're conferred all sorts of importance because of the job. The truth of the matter was I'd gone to the Turks and Caicos Islands. The government had been suspended for corruption and for a variety of reasons. Rather than appointing barristers at the time, the case was already to go to court. They appointed barristers from the beginning to build a case, and I'd only defend it. So it was the best way of staving off the long-term, if you like, flaws in a big fraud case. So I went out there on and off for four years. And it was wonderful at first. I mean, I hadn't known where it was. The only reason I knew about Turks and Caicos, because years ago, m my mum will corroborate this piece of evidence, I used to watch Miss World, and there was always Miss Turks and Caicos. And I arrived and I thought, goodness me, and of course, everyone has a relative who's been on a cruise who stopped there, of course. Um, and I knew nothing about it. And it was wonderful, and there was a beach, and I thought, this is splendid. But after week two, I was bored out of my mind. So I started writing scripts, as I did from time to time. A lot of friends uh, from university who were um, out of work actors, um, all of whom at various points have sort of lived in my basement. Um, and then one or two of them, one in particular, goes on to be the sexiest man alive. You know, Benedict, I say, not when I knew him, you know. They oh. were. <laughs> um, and so I was writing scripts, um, and I came back, um, and I went to defend in a case in Croydon, now, I say Croy and Deliberate, I'm sure it's a lovely place in the right sunlight. Um, <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's not a criticism, but there's a wonderful poem, you know, the John Betjeman poem, Come Happy Bombs and Rain on Slough. I expect because it was more assonant, more rhyming than Croydon, but there you are. <laughs> um, and the truth of the matter is, and I've written quite a lot about this, I'd passionately fallen out of love with the job. Oh. Um, my aunt yes. is here, and I have a cousin who's a defence barrister, a great human rights said. And whenever I have a young student thinking about becoming a barrister, I'll often try and so far as possible to get them to spend time with him. And the reason for that is because you have to be passionately invested in the job. Um, the client that I was represented was, at the time, the largest smuggler of, um, well, he had trafficked female, as they were then called, sex slaves into the UK. Gosh. And I woke up every morning utterly emotionally depleted. Mm. Your work doesn't need to be joy every five minutes. Yeah even once a week, even once a month, but it needs to give you the possibility, the potential of feeling like it has purpose. And I'd lost that. And so totally depleted, I was bankrupt. 
on or around that time, I was selling these scripts, which were dreadful. Um, but I'd networked, I was sort of quite good at that. And I ended up at a meeting with Helen Warner at ITV. I had no idea who she was. Um, and I went to flog this script. And I remember her saying she thought it was the worst thing she'd ever read, which I thought was hilarious. Um, it's an utterly fair assessment of it. But again, I suppose uh, more gifts from having good parents. I've never at all been um, intimidated or impressed by somebody's position or whomever they are. It's what they do that matters, how they come across to me. That's the stuff, the privileges you learn from childhood and education. Yes. So consequently, I just thought she was a great laugh and we ended up having this fabulous chat. And it turned out she'd written two of these chick lit novels. She defines it as that. I know it's not, it's a bit of a pejorative. So I went immediately and read them. I can usually plow through a novel in a couple of hours. All I'll say is, you know, you might read the brochure. It doesn't mean you're going on the package tour. I'll put it that way. It was, a, yeah. it was an education for me in a number of ways. <laughs> so I went back to Croydon. I was supposed to be listening to my client's evidence, but he was so utterly foul. Um, um, I ended up sitting in court writing a review of her novel. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not listening to him at all. No, I mean, no, I mean, he was so guilty. I mean, there you are. It was fine. I mean, yeah. I, um, <laughs> there was no injustice. The bar council aren't listening to that. Um, and anyway, um, so, uh, uh, and she laughed at it. And she said, look, there's this guy in Manchester who's interested in making a court programme. He's not met anybody. Will you go and meet him? Again, this is why I said it's luck. Right place at the right time. I said, yeah. sure, I'll go and meet him. And normally from the germ of um, not being on television to having your own show takes two years yes. or thereabouts yeah. as they... Longer. Uh, I mean, for it, you know, it's television, yeah. mm. so they do nothing and have meetings, you know. Um, <laughs> and you can't rely a word on... Well, I'm not suggesting it, but you know. That they, it's a lot of <laughs> meetings. But it's not like so lawyers, yes, you know. We go in, that's, it's, it's good yes. or bad. There's yes. a lot of meetings. Um, so I said, that sounds great. Didn't think anything of it. That was, say, February. And um, I took a brief in Jersey, um, which is a lovely part of the world. Um, and uh, it was a Jersey independent care inquiry. Mm. Some of you will have um, seen um, there was, well, there was endemic and systemic child abuse. Mm. And there was a... Um, yes, it was awful. It was awful. Interesting too, I mean, there were a number of things that emerged from that inquiry. But the reason I ended up being there was that there isn't a separation between the judicial and the legislative branches of government. So naturally, there was concern that the um, head of the inquiry um, wouldn't have access to all the materials, the government wouldn't hand it over. So the standard practice is to hand that over to independent counsel, me, um, to write the policy on disclosure and then hand over all the stuff. So that's what I was doing. And all of this is going on in the background. Judge Rindra, I thought, yes, 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 it's all television, nonsense, nonsense. And they flew to Manchester. And there it was, and it was, was my name. I thought, yeah. I mean, there's no, I thought, fuck. I mean, they were, so, <laughs> I mean, that's bleep, the truth of it. Bleep. bleep. I yeah. thought, bloody hell, you know, there, there it is. Um, uh, and it was four months. And she'd given it um, 10 episodes in the death slot in August. Mm. My first case was a woman who brought her um, wedding photographer into court, case number one, and I said, well, thank you, and I'm so glad, this is true, I'm so glad you've brought your mother here today to support you, that's my sister. No. Oh, no, <laughs> oh, dear. Um, Uh-oh. You know, my retort, we all stumble under some in, uh, unsympathetic lighting from time to time. Um, yet more luck, because it rained in August. Right. Everybody was inside, and it captured you. the public's imagination. Mm. But in terms of what surprised me, um, you know, I'd worked a little bit for a few weeks in Sierra Leone. I'd represented, albeit I'd been in meetings with um, lawyers for the clandestine services. Mm -hmm. By the way, that will rid you always of any idea that there are any organised conspiracies governing anything. Oh, really? Not the brightest, but there you are. <laughs> um, <laughs> the point is, um, you know, it confers on you all of this largesse just because you've done a job which public people think is, is desperately serious. But there were certain rules, certainly, when I was doing this work, which is, you know, if you're the most senior counsel there, you're the last person to go to bed, yeah. you do all the work, you make your own tea. I arrived on telly, mm. all these amazing young people running around, grabbing you tea. Yes. It, it, 
it's almost an infrastructure designed to interfere with people's moral chemistry. So I went to my, my senior producer and said, look, you're going to have to stop this. I know what I'm like. I'll be Kim Jong-un in a week. <laughs> it's not going to... But in terms of my surprise, what I have discovered, um, I'm not going to suggest it's endemic, but there undoubtedly is a problem. I'm not sure if you've experienced this. Um, I've been recently um, reading a lot about um, uh, the various, um, well, the hashtag MeToo movement. Mm, yes. I'm thinking of writing something about it. One of the things that I'm really interested in is that that seems to me to be, if you like, a symptom of a greater underlying problem, uh, a real darkness, an infrastructure, a, a almost a scaffolding that's much darker, which is that people who are so-called talent, mm. it's, got, it's getting better to a degree, are afforded behaviours that nowadays in other arenas wouldn't be tolerated. Mm. And they're enabled in a way. It doesn't happen because I work in Manchester and the boss of my show is from the Midlands and we don't have any of that stuff. But I've, I've noticed that yes. a little bit. I'm going to give you a, a very quick story about her. Um, we're regulated by Ofcom which means they do dips from time to time. That means is what we do, what we say we do, we have to do. The rulings have to be real. They can't interfere with my judgment. Yes. Um, case number three, more learning about people's lives I knew so little about. You know, you're freezing the assets of somebody worth 50 billion pounds. The next day, I find myself arbitrating a dispute, two people in front of me, and I say, um, this case is about uh, 120 pounds, I say, with my North London privilege. That's not a lot of money. Now, they're not supposed to speak to me, and what's more, they can ask for that transcript. My black country head of show got an earpiece, because I know an evidence is coming up. <laughs> she said, do you want to rephrase that? You sound like a right posh dickhead. <laughs> so, I mean... <laughs> that was it. That was it. She right. Was um, <laughs> but I should add, not long after that, or a couple of years in, I mean, in terms of my awareness, and this word privilege has become, you know, so, I'm afraid to say, shanghai by bad arguments. Mm. We don't identify what it is. I, I talk about mine because my privilege is having had unconditional love, being parented by somebody that said, I want you to be happy and meaning it, right? I mean, what a gift that is. Um, and also, I suppose, the privilege of being brought up in London mm. in a diverse community all of that stuff. And so, you know, what I discovered, case after case after case, real case after case, families breaking down over 250 pounds. We live in London and we know, whatever your financial circumstances, that's a meal out for four, for two, for one. Yeah. And Very after good. case after case of listening to this, of hearing how challenging it was, for people's lived experiences, interestingly, in Sedgefield and in Bolsover and all of these places. Mm. I'm sure we'll be asked about that later. I knew for sure, for sure, um, that Brexit was going to happen. Yeah. And, you know, it's, again, no secret, George Osborne's oldest daughter is my chosen goddaughter. And I'm, he thought the same thing too. Um, but the gift of learning, of being able to hear the lives of people I knew absolutely nothing of, and um, one of the lessons from Brexit, and increasingly, is I hope that we get better at hearing that. And you ask me about my show, there are two reactions. The minimal reaction, or the limited reaction, is people that say, oh, isn't that interesting? The thing that I complain about is the number of people that come up to me, and they do. And they say, um, those people. <laughs> you know. And I always say, well, what do you mean? Yes. You know, are you telling me you haven't had a broigus with a relative over money or don't know anybody who has, who's an accountant or a lawyer or somebody that is the cleverest person in your family but the least emotionally intelligent? Are you telling me that you haven't wanted to sue something over something that was really petty? That the law, all of these cases affects, affect everybody. The difference sometimes, and I emphasise sometimes, is that perhaps the people that appear in my court have had less privilege of an education. Uh, they certainly have less ready access to lawyers, so they choose to litigate in my court. Um, 
And often, they never, I should tell you, they never broadcast this stuff. Often I have a rant at the start of a case. Oh. Yeah. I really want them to broadcast that. The problem is they only broadcast the laughing bits on It's All Right on the Night. I never complain because you get 500 quid for the video. But there you are. <laughs> um, what sort of rant is it? Well, you know, like I said, um, when you have a family that's struggling and they're trying to work, that often happens. And I understand why it's difficult to feel sympathetic. I use that word on purpose. Mm for um, somebody that isn't trying. And we know what that looks like and feels like, and they have the capacity to work. I have to tell you, that's quite rare in my court. It's rare. Most of the time, what you discover is that, for example, it's somebody who is a permanent carer, let's say. I use that as an example. I don't know, that's one example. And what you find out through learning to hear, again, I'm more privilege. My, my mum's motto, if you like, I'm not sure what the Latin would be for, remember Hashem gave you two ears and one gob for a reason. <laughs> um, but, you know, you listen to this and what you discover is actually it turns out that they have absolutely no access mm -hmm. to help. What do I mean by that? Advocacy. Yes. That's a critical thing. So you'll meet a young person who you know ought to have been statemented some time ago. What does that mean? A as in, should have been given provision to special education. That didn't happen because their family didn't have the capacity to advocate on their own behalf. That's not by any means at all because they're stupid, not at all, quite the opposite. It's for three reasons. Firstly, because you don't have the confidence to confront authority. That means when somebody who's from the council or looks like, feels like, you get the sense that they're more intelligent than you or have power over you, says no. You say, OK. Yeah. Partially, partially yeah. the story of Grenfell too. Secondly, because who do you know in your network? Your network. Who are the barristers that you know or the solicitors that are going to help you out? There's no access to that advice yeah. at all. And thirdly, because what ultimately happens, let's say they've got a child who really needs that assistance and so can get the advice, excuse me, get the assistance they deserve, the help, that could be game changing for that person to become a productive member of our, of our community and a, a good neighbour and all the rest of it. What happens is they very often get angry and frustrated because they've never been taught to be an advocate on their behalf. And those three ingredients, if you like, are what I call middle class sharp elbows. The stuff that by and in large we perhaps I'm speaking to the one privileged here, know how to do or know somebody who can do that on our behalf. For millions of people in our communities who are unable, that's yeah. out of reach. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I've, I've learned that and heard it and seen the face of it in court. And, Rob, it sounds like you've been very humbled by a lot of these experiences. Yeah. Uh, you've mentioned um, your mother more than once, mm. who's sitting with us. And, uh, Thank and I you. wanted to mm. take you back to your own childhood uh, in Southgate. Yeah. And what sort of values your mother instilled in you? Your parents divorced when you were five. Yeah. I've read that you didn't always obey the rules at school. That was terrible. <laughs> so mm. tell us about the young Rob. Well, Younger, I'm not saying. Well, they're sort of, it's yet. really, you know, funny <laughs> if I was asked about this today. Um, mm. You know, I think we recurate our childhoods, you know, and as I say, I'm, I'm as an egomaniac, you know, I've, I've rewritten the entire thing, I think. Um, <laughs> certainly, I didn't grow up sounding like this. I'm a creation, you know, when my own special creation, perhaps. But um, um, Southgate was very different then to what it is now. Um, it was then, I think it's fair to say, I think, you know, uh, a, a working class community, um, culturally insular. I, you know, it's not language I use on behalf of my mum, but I think it wouldn't be any embarrassment for her because she's self-described in the early part of her life and journey as a shtetl frau. So there you are. You know, I don't think it was quite Golda and Anna Tevka, but there was certainly limited range. And I think that would be fair to say. Um, limited expectation, but but good good people, and diversity too, to be sure. Uh, no Jewish school, but very much Jewish life at the centre, Jewish cultural life at the centre of our um, family life. Um, I kept kosher. We went to Southgate and Cotfoster Synagogue, yes. and the rest of it, and, and absolutely imbued 
with a very strong and proud, which I've retained, Jewish identity, um, which was and remains, as I say, um, important. Um, but in terms of me, I always felt like a foundling. Um, you know, I've said this many times before, you know, you know, I remember being sort of five or six, going, who are these people? You know, I mean, I, and creating, I didn't know it at the time, but I think, you know, as you become more psychologically aware as you grow up, sort of almost uh, uh, creating an identity in opposition to the environment I found myself in, you know, and, um, and, and, and that's how, how this emerged. But I was dreadful, I think, at school. My mum's mantra is my brother was very clever and I was sensible, which I was furious about. Um, <laughs> And I like drama and doing that sort yes. of thing because I like being the centre of attention and would do anything to grab it, including, although uh, my mum's in denial about this, faking appendicitis on one occasion. Oh, um, well, I wasn't having my seven-year-old oh. uh, 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 classmate getting all of the cards. So anyway, um, <laughs> that actually happened. Um, but like I say, being shrouded in, protected in, you know, a real sense of, of love and all of that stuff that really matters. Yes. But never really, never being clever, just sort of, I think, it's hard to, I, I, I was sort of indifferent really, I was other. And I never really fit in. I think that's, that's probably fair to say. I was sort of good at drama and that sort of thing. And I was fine. And then um, I ended up at a, a school which I think is fair to say was probably not the best choice for me. You know, I, first of all, I came in the wake of my brother's reputation who enjoyed things that I did not, you know, rugby and sport and that sort of thing. So by genetic virtue, they give you a rugby ball. What am I supposed to do with that, you know? <laughs> There's a joke from Chorus Line. It's inappropriate, but there you are. We'll live with it, you know? <laughs> you know, my father was so ashamed. He used to tell people I had polio, so on Father's Day, I'd limp for him. But there you are. <laughs> uh, uh, but... Y yeah, I never found my own, and I certainly wasn't considered to be bright. I was sort of okay, um, average, sort of just teetering above average. Um, and then I found my mentor. Yes. Not at school so much. I mean, I had a, the school nurse, um, who was a good friend because I'm Jewish, and so that always helped. You know, I, I was asked today about what my neuroses are, and the answer is, well, I start the day with a terminal illness, and then, you know, You're at okay. the end of the day, right, yes. you know, again, it's a wonderful line, the best words in the English language are not I love you, but it's benign, you know. Um, You're okay, right. You're good, yes. <laughs> exactly, so, so the school nurse was just perfect mm. for me, um, but she treated me like an adult, mm. which was enormously important. I, I noticed inside there's a photograph of Nigella Lawson, Yes. and I was listening not long ago to her Desert Island Discs some time ago. They're with Sue Lawley, so they are over a decade old. And she described um, not suiting the condition of childhood. That really resonated with me. I felt right. Um, I definitely wasn't academically there, but I've always remembered being quite emotionally switched on. You know, it's probably an embarrassment, which I, I'm sure my mum will get over. But I certainly remember being cognizant of sort of announcement that they were going to get divorced and thinking, well, of course, you must. I mean, you're totally unsuited for one another. <laughs> uh, I mean, genuinely. And also thinking, God, how marvellous. We're the first in the community. Think of the attention. <laughs> you know, I mean, our, our magazine will sell out, you know. I mean, I'm not worried about sending to Kherim. I'm worried about the double-page spread, you know. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, yes. because my mum was working and eventually extraordinarily successfully and grew and learnt and has very viciously, because of that growth, intellectually and psychologically and emotionally, deprived me of any decent thing. The first three chapters of an autobiography. Oh dear. Not long ago, somebody approached me, would you like to write something about your life? And I mean, the, the difficulty is I've got nothing good to say. You need mis misery sales, it turns out. <laughs> Nobody wants to read three chapters of... So I found myself, you know, sitting with my mother in some emotional difficulty. It was to announce my divorce. And she said, how can I be mindful in this conversation? I said, throw something. You know, I want some histrionics or something. I've got nothing. You know, one, you need some misery porn or something. <laughs> nothing. Um, so my mentor at secondary school didn't exist, but then I went to Sixth Form College and um, Andrew Grice, the um, political editor of The Independent, his wife, who's not just been a mentor to me, but a number of students, sort of looked at me in this kind of way that I don't think I've ever been looked at before, actually. 
I wrote about it, in fact, last week in The Standard. Um, and uh, she said something like, you're, you're really clever, you know. <coughs> and from that point, somebody presenting me with an expectation, you're clever, made me, or conscripted me to want to meet it. So I ended up working really hard. I think I did five A-levels. Um, I got a first at university. I fell in love with books and with academia and with culture and with stuff that I'd never been presented by. Pretty much, I think it's fair to say, because somebody had crafted an expectation, yes. told me I was OK, and I thought, yeah, that sounds about right. But I developed late, I think it's fair, it's fair to say, uh, as well. So that's, yeah. Well, Rob, I want to keep you um, mm. on your family history. And of course, we have touched on it before, but the Who Do You Think You Are, right. which um, you know did very well for mm -hmm. BBC. And this was you learning more about mm. your grandfather, Morris, um, who, of course, was a Holocaust survivor. You went yeah. back to Poland. Right. How, tell us about the journey, how it affected you and the impact it had. It's so extraordinary. And, I, and actually, we, I've just made a um, two-part documentary for BBC, which is coming out in April, uh, which I'm incredibly proud of. Um, it's related. I, in answer to your question, um, I had the unique, not unique, the special advantage of growing up in the presence of, around, very present and around, uh, my grandfather. You know, because my mum was a working single mother, you know, she had, again, the privilege and gift of my aunt who here, was around the corner, and my grandma who would pick us up from school and feed us, and my grandfather who was present. So I knew him, in fact, I was, knew him till I was 23. I was at the bar, 22. And um, it, it, it informed everything. And what does that mean? It's really hard to unpick or describe what that means. But there's never a moment where a survivor, I believe, certainly back then, it's changed a great deal with extraordinary um, advocates um, like Marla in the front row. It's a privilege to see you, Marla. Um, who, I'm not saying it was always the case, but have been perhaps able to have the capacity and eloquence and confidence to tell the story in a linear fashion. In my grandfather's case, that was never the situation. Um, and now I'm third generation. It certainly wasn't true for my mum and my aunt. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. So you'd sit there, and then from time to time, there'd be these stories that would be told, um, often through the prism of anger you'd do something that didn't make any sense. Or you'd find small, dark discoveries when he died, when he was ill, <coughs> dotted about um, his house were little pieces of food tied up in handkerchiefs. And if you see a community of survivors leaving aside the profound optimism that you're left with, an affecting optimism that changes all of your chemistry and makes you delight in the world. It's the most unexpected reaction, actually, which I always try to share. If you get the gift and the privilege of meeting a survivor. There's also something else, I think, um, which in my grandfather's case for him was this unsaid, a dark shadow that you couldn't quite touch. Um, so he would tell us stories from time to time. And in 1998, when I was still a student, 97, thereabouts, we went back to Poland with my mum and my brother, but I wasn't ready then. And we certainly visited the town where he was from and the house that he was from. And it was just at the moment of pre-Soviet decay. So the, if you like, the corrosion had set in, but the glass factory that he and you, I think, and uh, Ben Helfgott had been slave laboured into, conscripted into, was still working. And you could go to that place. It was still a working factory. And I went to the building he was from again. And the strangest part about it was, I don't think I was ready for it. There was this extraordinary moment, which is impossible to capture in language. It's almost, again, I probably re remembered it, but it's sort of where uh, 
prose ends and poetry begins, the figurative begins, there was a moment where we went downstairs in this little quadrangle where my grandfather lived in a small room in the corner, and there was a woman. And he looked at her, and she touched him. It was seconds, milliseconds maybe. And in that moment, that human connection, there was complete profundity. It's almost where perhaps the human divine is best articulated. And it turned out that um, she had been the only non-Jewish family, the daughter of the only non-Jewish family, who um, had lived in that building. And she was, as is then, I'm not sure if it's a pejorative term, but I'm going to use it, she had been, certainly he would describe them as the Shabbos goys, who would light the fires and that sort of thing. And she had no idea he'd survived. And there he was, standing there, with his two grandchildren and his daughter. An extraordinary moment. I don't think I was ready for, to receive it, and I think it'd be fair to say that I think my mum hadn't yet done the work or gone on the intellectual and emotional journey that she subsequently has, which has been so informative to me as well. Um, so fast forward, yet more privilege, right? Somebody comes to you and they say, we'd like to research your family. We're going to do everything for you. All because a, a, a week ago you dealt with a case involving a man with a lime green mankini. Thank you. <laughs> that would be lovely. Um, and I arrived back into the town now in Pietrakov, outside of that extraordinary medieval centre, which still retains its historical memory. But outside the edges, certainly where the Jewish streets are, they're now completely dilapidated and disappeared. And I walked into the house where... The house, excuse me, the, the dilapidated flat that he'd lived in, and for me, I've always had a connection with architecture in some way. Um, you know, if you go to the Tower of London and you squint enough and you look at a brick, and you can just somehow imagine or share in the human memory that that brick retains. You know, you imagine Anne Boleyn on the way to the block, just if you can crowd out the noise of the flight path on the way to Heathrow. <laughs> but that brick retains something. It retains a historical memory. You can touch it. And the extraordinary part of this building was that all of the wood, all of the bricks, even the grass, was exactly as it was where my grandfather had lived and where these people who had existed only as names, as curious ghosts, had been. The next minute, this guy comes along, and he's, his name is Natanel. And I start looking around, and he's talking to me, but I'm not listening because I'm touching and thinking, this is extraordinary. And we find ourselves in that scene, which you may have seen, sitting in the light well. And he says to me, um, so it turns out uh, my grandfather and your grandfather were best friends. Yeah. What? Then he hands me a photograph, which I was completely unaware of, of my grandfather at his father's bar mitzvah in Israel. Oh Had no knowledge of this yeah. whatsoever. And the greatest gift of it was, was this moment, actually, um, other than seeing Ben, was um, it's a very difficult thing, but because I'd only know the names of these people, what's happening when you're doing that program is you're very mindful of the, it's a very posh way, no, it's an overstated way of describing it, the kind of macro-historical thing, very mindful of the burden that you have to tell the historical narrative in a true and authentic way, but also the privilege and gift that you're bringing back to your family who desperately want this story. So there I was, sitting there. Two extraordinary things. The first one is it turns out I was sitting there on the date of my grandfather's um, 95th birthday. Gosh. The next thing was this man, his grandfather had kept an almanac, a journal called Life in Pietrakov in Yiddish, and they translated it for me. And it included all of the names of my grandfather's four sisters and his parents. And what that did was really quite something. Because in each case, there was just one sentence. His father, a little man who darted around the place, um, small in stature, but high in hopes. Now, if you needed to contain my grandfather and articulate who he was in one sentence, 
you wouldn't, that was it. The names of these girls, they were good at school and loved drama. It's one statement that breathed, this lovely Jewish word, neshama, it breathed soul into them. It gave them animation. And I had a sense of who these people were, which I was able to gift to bring back to my mum and my aunt. And so fast forward, um, I mean, that was the most amazing part of it. And of course, they, tr they didn't tell me, <laughs> but I ended up um, in Schlieben, where Ben, Sir Ben Helfgott, uh, Marla's brother, had been. And they hadn't told me that, I, that he was going to be there. And I didn't have my glasses on. And I saw this man standing, and I, and I got closer, and, and there he was. And there were two moments about that, three, actually. The first one was how freezing it was. And people talk about cold. You felt cold. This was sort of mid-February. This was biting, unforgivable, vicious cold that bit into your very soul, right? And I was covered in gloves and a coat to imagine, to have the sense of what that would have been to be standing there. The next thing was this other thing, which was before I saw Ben, this whole place that had the most unimaginable dark memory had been blanketed over in nature. There's that Shelley poem, Ozymandias, you know, I met a traveler from an antique land. And there's this great big deity that had been there for a thousand years and it's now just covered in sand, it's no more. I remember that poem coming to mind because I was standing going, there's just a jagged suggestion of what was there. Nature had grown over and hidden this dark shadow that what had been there before. And then Ben. And Ben said, I'd like to tell you what your grandfather looked like when I saw him standing on this ground. Um, and there was the next moment, which is strangely the most profound, actually, where Ben held my hand and said, uh, let's get out of here. And just the act of him holding my hand and us being to go out together, he said, let's go out together. Yeah. What a magic, yeah. and what a gift. Um, and now, um, because of its, I say the word success, but you know, it was really, it was a good news story for, for the community and for education in general, because there wasn't a peep of anti-Semitism on social media that night when it went out. And it really was well received. And now, in fact, we have this two-part documentary where um, it will be out, I think, in April, I'll, I'll know tomorrow, where um, it's second generation also who are, don't know or didn't know the stories of their families, very difficult to curate, who are going to be telling those stories. And, um, excuse me, um, one of the interesting things, one of the challenges was how do we choose those stories? Yes, and who? Who? Yeah. There are so many. Mm. What criteria do you use in order to select them? Um, how do you make the Holocaust ever relevant, a story that can be heard I in a new way, experienced and shared? And so one of the first things that I thought to do was perhaps identify what you might loosely describe as the problem. And there are a number of challenging issues. One of them for me is that it's often the Holocaust presented through the prism of black and white at historical arm's length. And also in a challenging fashion has become not just that it's disappeared into the annals of historical memory, an increasing problem as the survivors are no longer with us, but also that it's been allowed to feature in our narrative almost as an Eastern European phenomenon. Yeah. An explosion of violence of one unassimilated community versus another. So it mattered for a variety of reasons to me that every story we told, in fact, apart from my own, was um, located in Western Europe. That idea, because that's where it emanated from, against the backdrop of seeming democracy, in Weimar, yeah. where you had access to abortion, nascent women's rights, look at the art that was happening, Freud, etc. Every story is in, in located there. The second element is to talk about second generation trauma, yeah. because that has resonances f for, for everybody and other genocides, to be sure, too, and other traumas. And lastly, there's an element of rescuing, yes. 
because I think people want to imagine that they'd be on the site of the right side of the righteous. Also because, as Maya Angelou said, you know, to practice any of the virtues consistently, you have to have courage. So telling these stories and persuading people to be courageous is, courageous. is, is useful. The last thing we did, very quickly, and I'll tell you about it, and I don't think we've talked about it a lot, is we ended up in Treblinka, where, um, say we, I took my mum. She's incredibly courageous at the time, but because she's your mum, you sort of take all that for granted. Um, and before we arrived, not more than perhaps uh, probably half an hour or thereabouts, um, the wonderful filmmaker said to the two of us, because um, I'd done my own research, of course, and been part of the community that were making this program, um, you're aware the last eyewitness in Treblinka had um, died a couple of years ago. It, 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 in fact, had been published. Anyway, he says, um, it turns out that's not the case. There's a man called Leon Ritz from a town uh, to the west of Gothenburg in Sweden. Uh, he didn't want to be here today. Uh, he saw your mum uh, on Who Do You Think You Are? And he's decided, um, actually, he wanted to come. So there's a moment where we went to say Kaddish and um, Leon was there standing on that ground. And the last scene is the most profound where um, my mum takes out a siddha from, I think it was my grandfather's. And he's standing to the left of her and I'm standing to the right of her as she's reciting Kaddish. And I was about, I think, to say the names of our family perhaps to remember Pyotrkov too. And as I was about to say it, I don't think he touched me as such, but he said, no, no, I remember it to me. He said, uh, this is for Kol Yisrael. This is for all of the Jewish people and all of the living people. He meant it for everyone. Yet more privilege, what a gift. Yeah. It was the most moving thing of my life. Yeah. Well, Rob, yeah. we, we greatly look forward to seeing that, mm. and uh, it's my fault, but no, I've, been I've kept on, you. <laughs> no, I've kept you over time, mm. and I want. Sorry. I've got so much more to ask you, but I want to open it up to the floor for uh, questions and answers. So ask please. about Strictly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't. <laughs> I I'm didn't cover sorry. Strictly, no, I no, not at all, okay. I didn't cover Strictly, and also <laughs> Bob's are. actually in training because he's agreed for sport relief, he's I walking know. across a frozen lake in Mongolia. I know. I know, next week, that's what you call a Mishagas for charity. That is, I mean, he's doing it, there I know, uh, but yes, yes, this gentleman here, please, yes. Yeah. I'll try and shout. Yeah. Um, I'll repeat it. Bearing in mind your, your lawyer's background, mm. and the, the travel events of the weekend, mm -hmm. Bearing in mind your lawyer's yeah. background and the terrible events in Streatham at the weekend, yeah. what are your views on governments bringing in legislation yeah. very quickly, very much a knee-jerk reaction to what's the tabloids? Yes. Well, I, can, un I now know what your view is about it. So I, this morning, in fact, I was on television and I, I met Priti Patel very briefly. Um, I can understand that instinct, but I suspect you and I share a similar concern that law made quickly and in a reactionary fashion, it's always bad, for example. But I also understand the public's concern, especially when it comes to sentencing. And the reason for that is because we, as a public, have been lied to forever. The reality is, when you're sentenced for six years, people don't assume or don't know or are generally horrified when they're told that you are automatically released after three years, regardless of whether rehabilitation has been successful or not. Two things very quickly in response to you. The first thing is I don't believe that she will or the government will find a way of making that lawful. For obvious reasons, it's not about that particular terrorist. It's not about that individual at all. It's not even about terrorism. But when I come back to my grandfather and why I love the rule of law, I'm, again, I'm confident you will share this with me. It's not about that individual. You have to know the basis upon which you have been deprived of your liberty. And just imagine for a second where it's perfectly foreseeable. We see political machinations happening even in so-called evolved democracies now. You are sentenced for some perhaps legitimate reason. Halfway through your sentence, the government decide to change the law for personal reasons. And they say, actually, you're now going to serve a further three years. We've changed the law. We're going to continue to deprive you of your liberty. There's a reason why law exists so you can confidently know precisely 
and the extent of your sentence so that there can't be political interference. And if they want to change the law moving forward, that's important. And they can do that, and I suspect they'll be able to. But as it applies retrospectively, that's a terrible idea. And in fact, it's a very important breach of the rule of law. The second thing is this, however. The thing that really annoys me about it, and um, I tried to speak to Priti Patel, who by and large, I should say, is a pretty thoughtful person. And um, I don't talk about my politics. I, I, I sit on various sides of the political art. But I think, generally speaking, a pretty thoughtful and good thing. Um, I should say that there's this as well, which is that we've stopped thinking about rehabilitation, which is why I went on television to talk about today. So it's all very well to throw people into prison and throw away the key. And I understand the reaction of victims who I've spent a lot of time having the privilege of hearing why they want that. But the reality is these are people who are going to be our neighbours. And anybody that's had the chance of being a barrister, for example, and seeing opposite a defendant, or meeting somebody who's committed a crime, or meeting somebody who's ever been to prison, will all, all of you, regardless of your political persuasion, say the same thing. Massive illiteracy in prison. Huge amounts. This is not a liberal point of view, it's a fact. Huge amounts of undiagnosed learning challenge. Massive amounts of mental health, massive amount of mental health problems. That's across the board. And they sit in prison with no education, no meaningful assistance, no funding. They end up being our neighbours. And so it's all very well to think about how we extend the sentences of these people, but we need to think much more thoughtfully. It's good for economics, apart from anything else, and much more meaningfully, creatively, practically, mindfully about rehabilitation. Because whether you like it or not, they're going to get out. And all of the um, penal systems that have done that, Norway is a good example. You know, to be a prison officer there takes three, year of tra three years of training, have had pretty happy outcomes. It's going to be very quick, Sorry. I'm afraid. Oh, we're not going to ask about Strictly? Cha -cha -cha. <laughs> oh, God, so anything, the, the anything else? Sorry. There, yes. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Well, did you enjoy your time on Strictly? Oh, what a lovely question. <laughs> <laughs> it was marvellous. <laughs> he came fifth. He Thank you. Very well. Thank you. Let's not feel Very well. That's very kind. <laughs> um, uh, you saw, yeah. <laughs> um, it was, it was a, yet again, talk about free, I mean, free lessons. So I arrived on the first day. And, I mean, it's not a... Look, they've got to make telly. Mm. So by the time I've done it, sort of, I think I was, what, the 16th year or whatever it With was. With my granddaughter. Oh, my gosh, your daisy's got... Of course. Oh, I've got... I, gosh, you, I forget how young you are. There, I know. So, um, <laughs> who's a sort of, a sort of mishpocha cousin -y sort of... I know. Um, uh, oh, there, there's Auntie Evelyn. Hello, everybody. All the mishpocha here. Um... <laughs> So, uh, hello, Uncle Jeff. There you are. So, um, <laughs> so, um, oh, isn't she? What a beautiful, what a git a shimmer she is as well. Lovely. She's as beautiful on the inside as she is on the, Daisy Lowe, the two of us. Um, but actually, uh, I think she'll tell you the same thing. I mean, Kanaina Horror, she can dance. <laughs> um, so the first day, not that she'd had any special training, but she'd done, you know, dancing school and been a bit stage schooly and that. I walked in on the first day, mm. having never danced, and I looked around, and it was like a scene from Fame. <laughs> I thought, well, you know, what have I done? You know, and um, Greg Rutherford, the long jumper, yes. who I became very friendly with, who subsequently has done bike rides from Norwood. I'm, I'm in the process of persuading him to convert. We're almost there. Um, <laughs> he's a slip away. Right. Oh, he's done a bike ride from Norwood. And so, uh, he's coming. <laughs> right. Um, and we look around. And, oh, my gosh. So we left and went to the park. But I thought to myself, um, it's a story I've, I've told a few times, but it is true. I thought, so, look, I'm going to be terrible at this, but I'm probably, the thing I really want is to practice my Russian, which I'm not great at, but I, you know, I, I did a lot of my interviews in the uh, new documentary in Russian, um, and I like reading it, and it's, you know, one of those things. I'm not great, but I've practiced. So, you know, there's that first episode where you're desperately surprised when they reveal yeah. who your dancer is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyway. You know, you right. must know. Well, no, no, it is true. I mean, you, you were not yeah. told, but I had asked for the Russian. Yeah. And the reason I had asked for Oksana, um, Oksana, Oksana. yes, she, 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 was no, she wasn't subsequently invited back. Oh, no. Um, Rob, what did you do? No, we'll come on to why. Um, <laughs> she was uh -oh. very, no, she was lovely, actually. Very, very lovely. But I thought, right, well, we'll be able to talk about all the things I really love. So we'll do, you know, a bit of Pushkin, <laughs> you know, might meander through a bit of late Dostoevsky. Who knows? Um, 
So on the first night you meet her, I went from, it's filmed in Elstree, back to my house in Islington, and we passed, passed Highgate Cemetery. That's my moment, <laughs> you know. So I said to her, um, you know who's buried there? No. <laughs> sort of I said, that's, that's Karl Marx. <laughs> he is a singer? <laughs> was, um, so, but, but, I, but actually, we had the most marvelous time. And the thing was, it was free. Oh. And I mean, the real hard part was that I don't, I think it's fair to say, have the emotional muscle memory to know what it's like really to be nervous. Do you know what I mean? I mean I, what do I care, you know? Um, and what they do is they, Daisy, of course, will tell you about this. I mean, oi, they deliberately conscript you into being terrified. How does it feel to go out in front of 30 million people? And you think, oh no! And fall on your toughest, <laughs> thrilled, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and you find yourself, and I'm never ever, and I have never been conscripted into saying anything I didn't want on television, apart from on Strictly. It was the first moment where you do all of that stuff and they put you in the sequins. And again, it's such a wonderful word. I found myself sort of glittery famished. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you, <laughs> <I've> <laughs> I think I said, I remember looking down the barrel end of that camera and saying, my whole life, all I've ever wanted to do is get to Blackpool. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> even, oh. you know, <laughs> but it was great. I mean, it was great. And of course, I met wonderful people. And I think, um, as Daisy's very glamorous grandma will tell you, um, <laughs> We were very lucky, actually, in our year. Uh, we were lucky because we all genuinely got on with we one did, another. Yes. It was such a, it was a lovely, supportive community. In fact, it got to the stage where when Daisy uh, Lowe used to dance, I couldn't watch because you become nervous. We yeah, really wanted, yes. it's also lovely television. Mm. It's television at its best. You know, people, again, criticise telly. Yeah. But, you know, this is one of those shows which is the last bastions of, it, of, of its kind. 13 million people watch. It's shared regardless of your class background, regardless of where you come from. For people who are in pain or have challenging lives of loneliness, it can be palliative relief. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. And here's the it's best a part of it. leveller. Right, and you feel the public want you to do well. Yes, yes. I mean, that's the best and thing. The judges. Despite my sex face or whatever it was they kept complaining <laughs> about. The judges were all up. Craig Revel Horde was definitely the nicest. Really? Uh -huh. He is, a, what about, lo he's so a lovely he's man. Yeah. Right. Um, I had, uh, Darcy Bustle I was a huge fan of. Um, I didn't have much to do with her. And um, last year of Lynn, oh, lovely yeah. man. Oh, yes. And actually very it's interesting because because he'd come from the East End. So mm. I'd had a lot of really interesting stories. And Bruno. <laughs> No, who's very nice. Yeah. Um, I mean, I because I used to give what they thought my undivided indifference. I didn't care, you know. Yeah. You know, I was terrified for the first few weeks, and then and eventually, then, when people say, "How do you feel going in front of twelve million people?" I thought, "Look, no one died." Yeah. Do you know what oh, I mean? Okay. You know, I'm not at the old Bailey. There, the consequences are, I lost a sequin. Who cares? <laughs> you know. Um, you, uh, I mean, uh, which puts into perspective all of the mitzvah dresses. Remember, yeah. people used to shop at Feynman's, and it was a sort of. Oh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> oh, Rob, I'm so sad, and um, I'm sorry, oh, ladies, sorry. that's were, all we've I've got just, time for. Oh, could I have one more? I could I have one more? One, one more? more? Okay, one go on, more. go on. Okay, one more. The gentleman now, just a quick... Sorry, quickie. Tanya. No, I, yeah, I, 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 I could be with you all night, but I know oh, that we have to... Say that in front of my grandma a couple of times, <laughs> she'll die, I'm sorry. <laughs> Last one. Hello, Rob. <laughs> Rob, yep. hello, Stephen Hi. from Pinner here. Oh, I'm looking yes. forward to come to Pinner Show. Well, we're looking forward to having you Baruch as well. Baruch Hashem, stop sending Thank emails, you. I love you. There <laughs> you are. Thank you. Um, <laughs> one programme yeah. that you were a guest on recently, I think, yeah. was, was on Michael McIntyre. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Why was are you clapping so for... Funny. Do you clap every home invasion? <laughs> <laughs> What's can, wrong with you? Can I ask how you <laughs> sort of how they set you up for that. Can I just please? describe it, for those of you who don't know the show, one Terrible. part of it is that mm. they go into a celebrity's home and they wake them up. Apparently, you don't know that's going to happen. And you sort of think, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, number it's one, what if you think it's a burglar or someone that you hit them over the head? Or it gives you a genuine <laughs> fright, Rob. But what happened? You think I'd hit a burglar over the head? <laughs> I, don't I mean, I've got, I've got a black belt in, you know, uh, furniture well, arranging and origami. <laughs> Like a do. I'd well, give him 
course. I'd give him life advice and tell him how to fold paper. What would I, you know? Um, what was featured on it? So tell everyone what happened. So I was told, look, um, he, they're doing this thing where they come into your house and wake you up in the middle of the night. They asked me ages ago. Yes. And I, uh, most of the time, uh, my agent, mm. I mean, you know, I don't know what they do. Nothing, as far as I can gather. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, you know, I like my agent very much. Um, Yes. Exactly so. Yes. It's like my class. Jill, you're absolutely right. Thank you, Jill. Quite so. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, also what they do, supposedly, is they filter things that you get all the time. You know, would you like to do celebrity one man and his dog? No. <laughs> you know, and eventually I started getting these offers going, and no, I, I, I'm not, neither am I going to be in going into the jungle and eating a kangaroo bollock anytime soon. <laughs> um, so don't send me the stuff because it makes me feel sort of, sort of bad about myself. But from time to time, they send stuff through. And he said, well, what about this? And I said, sure, and then forgot all about it because it seemed funny and et cetera. Um, and actually, I'd had um, a quite challenging week for a variety of, of reasons, which are probably too distressing to go into. But I had to uh, write something rather mm. thorny and difficult. And I'd forgotten all about it, but there was somebody in my house and the dog wasn't there. And there was, I, I felt that something was going to happen. So they'd told me, but they hadn't told me. And of course, I knew what was going on, yeah. which is why I went to bed and put on that T-shirt going, only Judge Judy can judge me. I thought, you know. <laughs> um, that gave it away, right, didn't but it? Well, I did sleep. I wasn't entirely sure. But I'm Jewish, so, you know, one glass of scotch and I was gone, you know. Um, <laughs> so to write this very difficult thing, I'd had a couple of gla glasses of scotch and I'd taken um, half a a Valium, whatever it was. Mm. And so that moment where he comes to wake me, I was genuinely in a coma. Oh. <laughs> so that, you know, I'm, I'm, but what was interesting, of course, is yes. that you know all these sort of famous people come through. Yeah, Greg Rutherford. Well, right, but yes. I suppose because of Ben and other people, I, you know, I've met mm. sort of really famous people, I suppose, the so-called in the spaghetti soup of celebrity, sort of A-lists. But, you know, after the initial flush of recognition, I'm bored now. You know, you can stand on the tube with, brace yourself, sort of George Clooney and, and Ben, and it's all very nice. But those aren't the people who excite you, because uh, ultimately, after the first five minutes, it's what do you bring? How interesting are you, all the rest of it? Um, but anybody who was on television from my childhood, that was the big stuff. Yes, and you went crazy Well, over. when Zamo Maguire from yeah. Grange Hill... <laughs> so shocked you were so excited well, because it wasn't just him. that I had all the yeah. annuals and as I got older I, I remember <laughs> most things I suppose it's it's a it's part I suppose of my I suppose, unique mental tapestry which doesn't help you sleep but I remember most things I read so all of a sudden he came and I was I, you were born in 1968 you had this job yeah. he, he broke into the house of his own stalker <laughs> <laughs> he did look a bit taken aback. Right. I was wonderful. so, I, you know, I yeah. was so excited, excited by it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, and they pay you. So, you know, there is that. <laughs> Great but just very quick, the very yeah. last part about that. It's, again, I'm not sure if it's a Jewish reaction, but I, it's very me. I suspect it's intuitively shared. They come in, they, I was awake. The next thing, it's like this whole business. They disappeared. And as they ran out the house, I thought to myself, oh, my God. I didn't give them anything to eat. <laughs> well, talking of eating, everyone well, sorry. must. Talking of food, everyone sorry. must be quite hungry. No, okay. Rob, it's been such a pleasure. It's been a and before I invite the yeah. wonderful Martha up on the oh. stage, I'd just like everyone to join me in thanking Rob Brinder. Oh, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Much.